Okay. Yes, I've spoken with the man. We can talk about that later. That's not what this is about. That was President Biden yesterday refusing to comment on Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's trip to China, says that's not what this is about. Now, House Republicans want answers as to why a U.S. official who traveled to China on the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre uh, abruptly canceled a hearing this week. A spokesperson for Congressman Darrell Issa says, quote, they don't want to talk about it. Joining me now is Arkansas Congressman, member of the House Foreign Affairs and Intelligence Committees, uh, also on the House Financial Services Committee, Vice Chairman French Hill is here. Congressman, it's good to see you this morning. Thanks so much for being here. You bet, Maria. Glad to be with you. So why do you think this hearing was canceled? Well, look, I don't think the administration has their act together on China, and this is something that's critically important. It's the most important foreign policy challenge that we have in our country. It's the most military and diplomatic challenge that we have. And so we need to have the, the, uh, the administration working with Congress on that strategy, which is why Speaker McCarthy set up our uh, China task force, our select committee, which is looking for ways to counter the moves that Xi Jinping has been making for the past decade that are aggressive both diplomatically, militarily, and of course economically around the world. And avoiding Congress is not the way to work together. Well, I mean, look, that select panel on China and you all in Congress are about the only ones pushing back on Beijing. Let's face it, we had a spy balloon travel the country for a week, uh, sending military secrets back in real time. We've got Beijing covering up the COVID disaster, still won't even allow an investigation into the Wuhan lab, police stations in America. You know, I mean, this is all on top of all of the other things we've documented for years, including the intellectual property theft, uh, reaching a billion dollars a year for, for companies. Uh, so when, you know, how should this administration push back and why do we keep going hat in hand to Beijing begging for a partnership? Well, look at the height of the Cold War. We had, uh, we had consistent diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Talking to China is an important step. We need to be addressing immediately right now what their plans are for their now exposed spy station in Cuba, for That's example. Right. So I don't, I don't oppose U, uh, the U.S. having meetings with China. I think we need to have more meetings with China, not fewer meetings with China, in order to make clear economically, militarily, and diplomatically how we want to see their uh, behavior change and follow the rules uh, that we've set out around the world. And this is what the failure has been the last uh, 10 years, to make that clear. And economic and military and diplomatic deterrence by the United States and leadership by the United States is critical. And the only way you do that, in my view, effectively is face to face. Well, that, well, that would all be very good if, in fact, they were holding China to account. But they're not. I mean, do you really expect Anthony Blinken to say, we want you to follow the rules of the global road and make sure you stick to it? I mean, well, one what, thing what the Biden administration, say? one thing the Biden administration has done, uh, Maria, and I'm no apologist for the Biden administration, is they've not fundamentally changed President Trump's approach to uh, China either in trade or military or diplomatic or financial pressure. And I think that's a message that Xi Jinping clearly gets and the message that we're sending by being unified on getting Putin out of Ukraine. These are the critical statements, but we need to deliver that message face to face. But Biden and his people have to come up and be accountable and a partner with the legislative branch on this matter. It's yeah. critically important. Well We'll see. I mean, not entirely. They canceled the China initiative as soon as Joe Biden took, uh, you know, the Oval Office. And, uh, of course, we've been waiting on some limitations to investing in Chinese companies tied to the military. We never got that either. But, but I want to switch gears and ask you about uh, cyber regulation, because I know you're aware that Patrick McHenry, the chairman of the Financial Services Committee, has sent a letter to the Securities and Exchange Commission asking to withdraw their proposal to change the definition of an exchange. Congressman, uh, Patrick McHenry says, uh, we urge you to withdraw this proposal as it would effectively shut down development of the digital asset ecosystem and continue to stagnate U.S. technological innovation. Your thoughts? Well, this is, a, this is a big deal. I chair the subcommittee on digital assets, and we're in the process right now of drafting legislation that will be bipartisan, it will be bicameral, to create a regulatory framework for digital assets. We want Web3 development, innovation, and ideas in and around uh, payment tokens uh, flourishing in the U.S. under a regulatory framework and not pushed offshore to less regulated environments. And that's precisely what Chairman Gary Gensler is doing. And this is one of the most recent steps in 
seen him trying to govern our digital assets by enforcement instead of working with Congress on the proper statutory, statutory framework. Uh, this would essentially uh, make it uh, null and void for trying to trade a digital asset on an exchange. This is one of a series of mistakes I think Chairman Gensler is making. He's also done that on custody and also on defining what's a security and what's not a security in the digital space. Well, I mean, you've been working on this now for a long time. Have they been consulting you and your subcommittee in terms of what the framework should look like for cyber? Well, the administration has at the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve and our colleagues on both sides of the Hill and Democrats and Republicans, but we have not gotten the kind of collaboration that we'd like from the SEC, and yeah. we've gotten it from everybody else. And so we're encouraging Chair Gensler, let's work together and not uh, work against uh, the middle on this because you're hurting American innovation. You're going to put America behind Europe and other jurisdictions on this important futuristic and critical uh, financial technology and, and web technology. Yeah, I mean, especially since financial services companies are working on tokenization and digitization right now uh, and, and really need uh, some kind of a, a format for the rules of the road. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, meanwhile, testifying before the House Financial Services Committee this week, facing questions about what high inflation means for the economy. Let's take a listen to that. Watch. Does the National Bureau of Economic Research directly consider inflation when determining if we are in a significant economic decline? Inflation is not part of an economic decline. <laughs> uh, Congressman, you also questioned Yellen about why the International Financial Institution seems to think about everything but economic growth. I, I don't know. I don't see a growth strategy out of this administration. Do you? Tell me more. Well, the median household income in my home state of Arkansas is $44,000. And if you don't think a 40-year high in inflation uh, unleashed by too lax monetary policy and failed fiscal policies doesn't hurt people. That's nuts. It's a, uh, Arkansans are spending an average of $7,000 more last year and this year than they were the year prior. And that's clearly because of inflation and that hurts people's growth, hurts people's net worth. And so it, on a macro basis, you can think about it in the same way. This is why I think the secretary's off, uh, off tone on that. She's wrong about it. Inflation is a thief to business and family and household accounts. Well, a part of the issue is all of this spending. We've spoken with many former central bank heads, and they say the Federal Reserve is pulling down inflation, but they're also facing this tsunami from the fiscal side of the equation, where the spending continues. Congressman, where does that stand? I know you all just came up with a debt ceiling bill that the president signed in terms of uh, limiting spending, but you still have things like Biden's effort to forgive student loan. You still got unaccounted uh, COVID money. I mean, there's still money swashing around, isn't there? Tremendous amounts of money. Our discretionary budget spending is 40 percent higher than it was in FY19 before the pandemic. We've spent money, as I've said for years, like uh, drunken sailors. And the debt ceiling bill, the fiscal restraint that was in it, tips that down in the right direction. But I want to go back to a time where both Democrats and Republicans felt like the smallest deficits were the, the goal, and we fought about how to get there. We've lost our minds in this pandemic process, uh, and so we need to cut spending, right. and that's why we've taken a first step. But there's much, much more to do. Congressman, good to see you this morning. Thanks, Thanks very Maria. much.